Notice closely, you bridge fiends. These girls were not as dumb as they looked. From a simple parlor pastime to an international game of skill and tactics, bridge boasts a colorful and exciting history. It's a story filled with larger-than-life characters, spectacular public matches, and even passions gone astray. All of which, for a time, put bridge on a par with baseball as America's most popular sport. By the turn of the 20th century, a card game known as whist had become very fashionable. Two sets of partners tried to win as many tricks or hands as possible. The game evolved into plafond in France and elsewhere into auction bridge. The auction or bidding would decide which suit was Trump. While on a cruise in 1925, Harold S. Vanderbilt developed the game of contract bridge. He devised a new system of scoring that added the concepts of vulnerability and slam bonuses. The new game spread like wildfire. In 1928, the first national championship was held for the Vanderbilt Cup. Vanderbilt later won his own trophy twice and it became the most sought after American team honor. One of the first and most popular American teams was made up of Oswald Jacoby, P. Hal Sims, Willard Karn, and David Bruce, known as the Four Horsemen. For three years, they won most of the major American tournaments, just like the Four Horsemen at Notre Dame, who led their football team to an undefeated championship season in 1925. But the game's real popularity came with the rise of Ely Culbertson, a brilliant self-promoter who would soon become known as the Emperor of Bridge. The child of a Russian mother and a Scottish-American father, he taught himself to play contract bridge. In 1929, he started a campaign to make a name for himself by launching the Bridge World magazine, in which he promoted his Culbertson system for playing. This table gives a precise yardstick for measuring the honor values during the bidding. But the Culbertson system soon came under harsh criticism from abroad. Its followers are bumble puppies, quacks. From bridge writer Walter Buller, who had his own British system. I feel that a good British four could be got together to take on the Americans, and that while not necessarily the best available, they would beat them sky high. Culbertson quickly accepted the challenge. His American team, which included his wife Jo, won by a humiliating margin. More was written about the match than any previous sporting event, and contract bridge began to become a global pastime. Culbertson simultaneously published The Blue Book, touting his system. The first edition sold out in days and eventually sold more than a million copies. That set the stage the following year for the bridge battle of the century. Sidney Lenz led a group of U.S. players opposed to Culbertson's system. Very well, Mrs. Culbertson. You have won the cut, you will deal, and the tournament is on. The long match, begun in the Culbertson's New York apartment in December 1931, attracted more than a hundred reporters from around the world and made bridge a spectator sport. Two no trumps. No bid. Three diamonds. No. Soldiers guarded the cards. Stenographers recorded every word spoken. Culbertson later claimed more was written in American newspapers about this match than on the first flight between the U.S. and Europe by Charles Lindbergh. When the Culbertsons won the match by 8,980 points, sales of Culbertson's books skyrocketed again, and he became a millionaire. In an odd twist, a highly publicized murder trial helped fuel the attention on the match and the popularity of bridge in general. Mrs. Myrtle Bennett of Kansas City was on trial for shooting her husband, John, after they lost a round of bridge when he failed to make the contract by one trick. She claimed the shooting was accidental, and a sympathetic jury acquitted her. In 1933, Culbertson challenged Britain's Pops Beasley to a match in London for what he called the World's Championship. 27,000 people came to watch, including some of the British royalty. Those who couldn't get in watched through periscopes in the walls. Again, the Americans won, 
and Culberson became even richer and more famous, writing a book about the match, selling his own brand of playing cards and supplies, appearing regularly in newspapers and on the radio, and even appearing in six short films produced to take advantage of his astounding popularity. Sometimes high stakes offer a real test of skill. Joe Shuffle, isn't it? Bye. In 1937, the American Bridge League and the United States Bridge Association merged to form the American Contract Bridge League, ACBL. That was also the year that lawyer-turned-bridge expert Charles Gorin began his rise to prominence. With a high card point count system that was simpler and more accurate than Culbertson's system, he began to win tournament after tournament while also writing best-selling books and newspaper columns. In 1940, Gorin partnered with Helen Sobel to win the National Open Pair Competition. Sobel is now considered to have been the world's best female bridge player. Her partnership with Gorin would become one of the most famous in America, lasting for more than two decades and resulting in numerous championships. In 1950, Gorin was part of the U.S. team that won the first Bermuda Bowl, a competition between the U.S., Europe, and Britain that later became a true world championship with more countries taking part. He became known as Mr. Bridge and even hosted a national television show, Championship Bridge with Charles Gorin, which ran for five years and featured bridge experts and celebrities. And now here's Charles Gorin, the star of our show, Mr. Bridge himself. And of course, as usual, Charlie and I will bring you a card-by-card -card play of this week's match on Championship Bridge. By the time Gorin landed on the cover of Time magazine, his point count system had again transformed the game leveling the field and making it easier for the estimated 35 million bridge players to play. But although Gorin reigned as the king of bridge, the U.S. found it was no longer such a power player on a global scale. Teams from other countries began to win the Bermuda Bowl, denying the U.S. the world championship for more than a decade. But in 1968, Dallas financier Ira Korn Jr. organized a full-time paid professional team known as the Aces. A coach guided them through 50 to 60 hours of practice a week and used a computer to analyze their play. With Bermuda Bowl victories in 1970, 71, and 76, the Aces re-established the U.S. as the most powerful force in world bridge. Today, millions worldwide still enjoy this mind sport and compare its popularity and complexity to chess. The American Contract Bridge League currently has tens of thousands of members in North America. ACBL supports millions of tables of bridge in play annually in clubs and tournaments, manages three major championships each year, and certifies bridge directors and teachers. The League also supports bridge in schools and educational programs as a way to help develop the minds of a new generation. American billionaires and ACBL members Bill Gates and Warren Buffett, both avid bridge players, even donated $1 million to introduce bridge to U.S. middle schools. I've never met anybody that spent the time to learn the game that didn't consider it one of the great things in their life. It, it's deliciously simple in, in the rules, but deliciously complex in, in doing it well. Technology has also made it easy for anyone who wants to learn or play bridge. Tens of thousands of people also play virtually on websites such as Bridge Base Online, which includes an ACBL-sanctioned online club where players can earn master points. A variety of computer software is also available to help people learn the game and track their progress and tournament play. Bridge has certainly come a long way.